but right now I'm talking about puzzles and puzzles can be a challenge. Let me know if you use puzzles in your classroom. And here is what other teachers have told me um, about puzzles in their classroom. And let me know if this resonates with you or not. When your kids play with puzzles or put puzzles together or you give them puzzles, do they ever get frustrated and then not put them away? Like they just leave the puzzle in this big giant mess and walk away. Does that ever happen to you? <laughs> yes. Um, that happens all the time. And let me just say that's normal, okay? And there are ways around that. There are ways that you can fix that. Yes, Barbara says, we use them every day, but they get dumped a lot. Jenny says, I used to use them a lot. They're really hard to manage cleanup. Yes, so I have some tips for you here. And the reason that puzzles are difficult or challenging for a lot of teachers um, <laughs> lies in the developmental sequence of how children learn puzzles. So here's what I found when um, I really believe strongly in the power of puzzles. There are so many educational benefits, especially in today's day and age where our kids aren't getting puzzles at home. They're not um, touching and manipulating. They might put some on the screen, you know, but they're not getting the full benefit. So, and they're not something that a lot of kids have at home anymore. So for the last 20 years, I've always recommended that whenever parents want gift suggestions, I always recommend puzzles for any child. Um, but some of the benefits, this is just some, not all, but so many benefits from using puzzles in the classroom. These are all benefits that children can derive from using puzzles. Critical thinking, right? Could your kids use a little more of that? Problem solving skills. Puzzles are great for critical thinking and problem solving skills. Visual discrimination. They have to really focus and figure out how these shapes turn and flip and fit into the space. It also involves concentration. So you'll see your kids with the least amount of concentration abandoning those puzzles more quickly, right? They don't have the attention span for it hand-eye coordination. Their little hands gripping the puzzle pieces. I have had kids in the beginning of the year who when the puzzle pieces were lying on the floor or the table, they would try to pick them up like this. And I'm like, no, we use our fingers, our fingers. That's fine motor. Um, yeah, it's so difficult. It seems so much easier, but it's not. It's very, very difficult. Of course, your basic skills, when we put basic skills into puzzles, we're getting all kinds of extra benefits, colors, shapes, patterns, um, visual memory. They have to remember, okay, this piece went here and it had these colors on it. And then it's very abstract for them to figure out, okay, I have this piece that has the same colors to make that connection. And oh, it, maybe it goes over here. And so whenever I help children with puzzles, here's one tip, a uh, good tip. Um, I always talk through my thought process when I'm helping a child put a puzzle together. So if I find a piece, I go, oh, this one has this kind of shape and I see it has down here. Those are, those are the wheels of the car and then it has this bump on the top, that's the siren. That's a police car, you know, and I'll talk through it and I'll go, I wonder where the police car could go. Do you see anything that has two, we two bumps on the bottom for wheels and a, a bump on the top for the, for the siren? You know, I talk through my thought process because they're, they're, they don't think like that. They're, they, they're not natural critical thinkers. I don't do that all year long for every child, but when I see a child struggling, who I think might become a dumper and runner when it comes to puzzles, then I stop and take the time to do that. Um, Linda says she loves puzzles. It's difficult, but well worth having because the benefits are huge. Absolutely, uh, Linda, I couldn't agree more. Um, Okay, but here's the thing, and this is one of the reasons teachers struggle so much with puzzles. When I started mentoring teachers, this is what I found. When I would go into classrooms that didn't have puzzles, I would ask, you know, do you have puzzles? Oh yeah, we put them away, the kids can't do them. They're just a mess, they're hard to manage, we can't clean up, you know, all, all this stuff. So then we would look, okay, let's look at the puzzles that you have. And then that's when it, the light bulb went off in my head, like, okay, now I know why puzzles don't work for you. Because if we don't have the right puzzles for the different stages of development that our kids are at, then the kids will struggle, right? So here's a little sequence for you. Um, the first sequence are peg puzzles. 
okay? Those are the ones where they have the little pegs on top or the little handles of some sort and the kids pull them out and put them in. I don't have any of those because the standard age for that is two years of age. And um, that's, just a, that's just a rule of thumb. All children develop differently, we know that. Um, but I generally don't work with two-year-olds, so I don't have any of those. And if you work with children with special needs, they may be at that two-year-old puzzle stage. But those are perfect for kids to pull out and then just put back, pull out and put back. That's like the very basic beginning puzzle stage, okay? So if your kids have a lot of fine motor issues, if they're delayed in any way, getting those puzzle pieces out can actually be a challenge and can lead to dumping and running. So you're going to want to, if you have children of that age level or that ability level, you're gonna to wanna to start with peg puzzles, okay? Now, if you have children that have some prior knowledge of puzzles and some exposure to, some of them will say that the peg puzzles are for babies. And I, and I always tell them, you know, because I usually have some kids that are at that level, um, you know, we all learn differently and this is where so-and-so is at and so forth. So anyway, um, picture puzzles. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, inset puzzles without pegs. So this is a very, very simple puzzle. And these, most of my puzzles come from Lakeshore because when I have puzzles in my classroom, I want them to last for a lifetime. I do not want to buy the puzzles over and over. And so that was another one of my tips um, that I saw with some teachers who were struggling with puzzles. If the puzzles are low quality, like the cardboard ones, sometimes they get ruined very easily. And um, if kids can't manipulate them and they're not, the pieces aren't big enough, they don't have enough uh, definition to them for them to pick up easily, then they will struggle as well. These are really high quality puzzles that will last a lifetime for sure. They're wood. I don't think they even sell this kind anymore, but they do have lots of puzzles. I don't work for them at all. I just, there's some things I buy at the dollar store and there's some things I buy at like sure. <laughs> It just depends, um, but this is one of them. So this is something you might want to save up for or write a grant for, or ask your administrators for, because these are pricey. Puzzles are pricey. That is the truth. Um, let's see. Yes, so these are very simple because do you see this right here? There, this is where it has been cut out, right, by the machine, I'm assuming. <laughs> and the piece can only go here, right? It can't go anywhere else because that shape doesn't appear, that exact shape. Well, maybe in this particular case, it might go there. Let me see. No, it doesn't fit in that other one. I just realized there was a similarity there, but it doesn't fit. So they can, it can only go in one place on each of the puzzles, on each of the little mats here, or what do you call these, the board. And these are small, these are perfect for the hands of young children. Sometimes puzzles can be really, really large, um, like really obscenely large. And that's because sometimes the children using them are very tiny and they need to be stable and they need to have enough weight for them to be able to grasp and pick them up and to feel that. Um, but as children get older, the puzzles can get a little smaller. These are not choking hazards, these are all um, safe here, but they have the shape cut out. So there's really like no question where, where can this go, right? So this is basic matching and visual discrimination, right? Very basic. I find that these are really good for my four-year-olds in the beginning of the year, but it's really going to depend on whether your kids have had prior exposure to puzzles or not. So some of your kids who have, this might be too basic for them. But in my particular case, usually my kiddos do really well with these type of puzzles in the beginning of the year. And then we progress on to the next stage. Um, oh, and this one is um, one, two, three, four, five. I found that puzzles with five or six pieces are perfect for my kids, my four-year-olds at the beginning of the year. So keep that in mind. So if your puzzles have too many pieces, if they're too difficult, then your kids will struggle, right? And they'll become frustrated and then you'll end up with big puzzle messes. Um, and my rule in my classroom was always that if you can't put a puzzle together, if you're having trouble, you have to ask a friend for help. 
because it's not an option to just leave your puzzle on the floor because then we lose pieces. Like there is a very strict rule, ask a friend. And if that friend can't help you, find another friend. There's almost always somebody in each class, a child in each class who's excellent at puzzles, right? And you know who that kid is. So you might even say, you know, I see that you're looking for a friend to help you with puzzles. Did you know that Roberto is really good at puzzles? Yeah, he's kind of a puzzle master. You should ask him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I try not to come in, swoop in and fix the problem for them because then that doesn't teach them problem solving or persistence, which is another thing that puzzles do. Um, hey, Ivy, konnichiwa. Um, so the next thing that you do is moving on to puzzles with um, more pieces. And here's another Lakeshore example. And in this case, now this piece here, if you can see that, it can only go here, right? So these pieces on the outside are easy, but look at her skirt. At the beginning of the year, we would usually do this in October because that's when we did Little Miss Muffet. Um, there is a shape, but there's five pieces if we count her body, right? Or four pieces. And that's going to be a game changer for some kids, right? That's going to be difficult for some of them who are going from just matching those shapes, right? Those cut out shapes to then getting all of these to fit in there. So I often will have kids struggle when I first put these out. So sometimes I'll pair them up and try not to hold it upright too much because the pieces will fall out. But it, what this puzzle does, what this kind of puzzle does, is it offers children some some easy success, right? Because these pieces, they can only, this can only go here. That's it. It's the only place it can go. But this part's a little harder. So they, they experience some success around the edges. And then they can work on their persistence and all their other skills there in the middle. Yes, Lisa, some children put together puzzles yeah, those kids have had a lot of experience, 24 piece puzzles, that's great. But generally speaking, these are the general ages. So congrats to your daughter, yeah. So, it, so you might have some kids in your class, because kids all develop at different rates, right, who are ready for a 24 piece puzzle. And then you might have a kid who's ready for just peg puzzles. And that's why puzzles become a mess in the classroom, right? Because all kids have different ability levels. So what I try to do is buddy them up when I can. I have them ask a friend. Um, and then, and I don't think I got one out, but the puzzles without a base. So do you see how this puzzle here, it has these clear cutouts for things to go in, right? It's very clear. But what about when you have a puzzle that doesn't have a bottom to it, like a floor puzzle? So those are very complex. But the good news is, is that kids can work collaboratively and they can use the picture from the cover of the box to help them. Usually what I do in the beginning of the year is I will model how to think through and how to work with somebody to put a floor puzzle together. When children experience the success of putting together a complex puzzle, that motivation for them is huge. They're more motivated to do it over and over again. I used to have kids, uh, they would usually go to the puzzle center in small groups, right? Um, some kids just naturally gravitate there. And they would spend the entire time trying to put together this floor puzzle. And if they did it, it was like, the Red Sox won the playoffs, right? I mean, it was huge. And they would be jumping up and down. They would call up all their friends over to look at it. They had just this great sense of accomplishment because doing a puzzle without a base, like a floor puzzle, is very difficult. And they should have that feeling of success and that feeling of motivation. Um, they should have that. And so when kids experience success in any way, shape, or form, it's always a good thing, right? Because they become motivated. They get encouraged. They, they have this sense of self-worth from it. So many benefits of puzzles. Um, so the, in the interlocking pieces, oh, I have some of those here. You see these? pieces here. This is from another Lakeshore set. <laughs> These types of um, 
interlocking pieces, if you will. These are very difficult for a lot of young children. So this is the, the last step in the puzzle process. So, um, and that's what your floor puzzles have. They have those interlocking pieces and that's why they get ruined so easily because kids just do this to them or they bend them and, and they can get ruined really easily because they're not all ready for um, those interlocking pieces. So, um, I would try to use some wood ones if you could first to show them how we take them out and put them in. But these are the most difficult. So if you have two or three year olds and you've got interlocking pieces, do you see how that could be a real challenge for some of them? Um, we have to look at the ability, le ability levels of the children we work with. And we also have to take into consideration, you know, their individual uh, skill levels and if they have any delays and so forth. So you could have, um, 20 kids in your class and you could have kids at every single level of the puzzle process. So just being very cognizant and aware of where your kids are with their puzzles and putting out puzzles that match the majority of their skills um, is going to be really helpful. So yeah, uh, Joan says the children in my class love puzzles. It's one of the first centers to be picked for the day. That's awesome. That means you're doing something right, right? You've got the puzzles out that ch they're just the right level of challenge. They're not too easy. They're not too hard. They experience success, right? That's awesome. Um, Teacher's Day is in Brazil tomorrow. Well, happy Teacher's Day. Um, yes, uh, Shailene says she draws um, shapes or letters or numbers on some of mine to help them out. Are you talking about it on the back? Yeah. So there's lots of color coding things you can do with like colored Sharpies. Um, you can write on the back little dots or whatever, like Shailene was saying, um, to make sure that the, some puzzles go back into the right place. I find that usually what it does is it helps me the most if I have to clean up afterwards because I can look on the back and say, this has a red dot, this goes here. Instead of putting all the puzzles together and then figuring out where the piece goes. Um, I try to also have that puzzle master in my classroom check the puzzles at the end of center time to make sure that they're put back appropriately. Um, yes, Lorian says we need to have kids using interlocking puzzles. So there's a process to that, Lori. So they can't just go from um, not using interlocking pieces to using interlocking pieces. It's a process that they have to go through. So that would be helpful for you to look at that process. Um, and I put the link above in this one. Um, yeah. Uh, I think Jennifer was saying the same thing. I color each puzzle backing one color and that way we know. Yep, it saves you time later, doesn't it, Jen? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so another thing um, that I like to do is, and I, oh, I did bring this one with me, yay. Okay, so this is, um, if you look at it this way, maybe it looks more familiar to you. This is like a letter rack. And I kept the, I always keep the labels on things. So when people ask me where I got it, I can tell them it came from Staples, but you can get these anywhere. But if you set it like this, look what happens. And if you put it on a shelf, now holding it up in the air isn't going to do any good. But my, one of my problems with puzzles is that, um, I don't like those big giant puzzle racks. They take up so much space. They're gigantic and they're very difficult the wire ones especially to get in the puzzles in and out of um, so i like to use these types of file storage things this is a, this one is for small puzzles obviously you can't put big ones on there it's rather small so i use it for my small puzzles but then i also have the letter stacking trays and the letter stacking trays fit these so you can stack your letter trays and they're they're this wide so the kids can get them in and out really easily and you know you can put your puzzles out on those and they don't cost an arm and a leg like those wooden puzzle racks from the teacher store. Um, they're very inexpensive. You can get them in packs of, I forget how many, I guess packs of two from Walmart for like a dollar or two or the dollar store and then you just stack them up and you can put your puzzles in them and it's wonderful and you can hot glue them together if you're afraid that they'll come apart um, depending on which ones you get sometimes they will come apart so just hot glue them together yeah <laughs> 
All right. I have a child who's excellent at floor puzzles. Yes. Some children are excellent at the spatial relationships, um, the critical thinking, the problem solving, and they may lack in other areas. They may lack in social skills. Absolutely. I would say that's fairly, yeah, normal. Um, Oh yeah, I saw that one already. Okay, and then my floor puzzles. So this is one that I know a lot of you struggle with. Does anyone struggle with the floor puzzles in your classroom? Um, those boxes, they just don't last. They're not designed for young children to use them independently because getting that lid on, I don't even, even I can't do that. So I just cut the, the top off, the piece they need to see, right? They need to look at to figure out how to put the puzzle together. And then I find boxes for the other the pieces right so I have a plastic box I have I have one here but I didn't get it down um, I just look for plastic containers that will fit my floor puzzles and then I tape the top of the box you know the picture that I cut out I tape it to the top of the box and my rule with floor puzzles is because they don't have a base is that one floor puzzle at a time otherwise it can be quite a problem to figure out which pieces of the floor puzzle go to which box um, of course you can still color code them but um, I like the kids to be working in groups when it comes to floor puzzles. That's one of those social benefits of it. The problem solving, the sharing, the turn taking. And then one child can usually inspire another child and they see the other child doing it and then they start to have a little more persistence and problem solving. It just, they all just play together. You know, all those skills just play together really well. So um, I try to have them work in groups on those. So you're gonna wanna have an area just like you do for everything else in your classroom, clearly labeled, right? So your floor puzzles label on the top. And then here's a, here's a pro tip. Take a picture of the, of the picture, right? The picture that you cut off the top of the, the floor puzzle box. You take a picture of that and then you print that out and that becomes your shelf label. So now you have the picture on the, on the box and the picture on the shelf. And then you can take pictures of the puzzles that you have as well and put them on your um, file those file trays I was talking about. Um, think about the age appropriateness of your puzzles. Do they meet the developmental needs of your students? Um, and then of course, anytime you're having any problems with any center, think about modeling um, the behavior, expected behaviors, what they should and shouldn't do with puzzles, how to put them away, how to take them out, what they should do if they encounter a problem. Because I find that with the dumping of the puzzles or the leaving of the puzzles, it's just because they don't know what to do if they get stuck. So I just explained to them, if you get stuck on a puzzle, here is what you do. Step one find a friend. <laughs> Tell your friend, I'm stuck with this puzzle. Can you help me? If your friend says no, find another friend, you know, and then I identify the puzzle master if we have one. If it's early in the year, you might not have a puzzle master yet. But like somebody here was saying in the comments just a few minutes ago, you know, she has a kid who's doing, you know, floor puzzles like a champ. Yeah, he's your puzzle master right there. Um, yeah, so you're going to want to let them know what to do if they get stuck, right? Um, so that's anytime we have a problem with any center, that's what we wanna do. Another thing you can do is buddy them up. So make sure that they have a buddy and, and then two kids can do the puzzle together. Um, you have to have the right buddies though, because sometimes one kid will dominate and another kid will just kind of sit there and watch the other kid put the puzzle together. So you kind of have to be careful with that. Um, let's see not a lot of room for puzzles. So that's okay, Noel. If you don't have a lot of space in your classroom, you can take the puzzles out, um, you know, put them away and take them out. Um, you don't need a lot of space. Um, it would be great if you could have them out, but we don't all have that luxury. This thing behind me here, this is a paper tray from Ikea, and this is also great for puzzles because look at the drawers pull out. I love it. It fits these um, like short puzzles too. Okay. <laughs> Terry says, with her very little, she hands out the pieces, they talk about the puzzle and take turns. Absolutely, with those itty bitties, that's what you gotta do. Um, you're very welcome, Terry. <laughs> yes, and a lot of people uh, use puzzles. Um, in the morning when the kids arrive at the tables and that's totally cool too. Um, yeah, so you're gonna to wanna to have your puzzles organized, labeled, easily accessible for the kids. I find that those floor puzzle boxes are just a hindrance. 
and they can just lead to all kinds of frustration and problems at cleanup. Um, yeah, so those are my puzzle tips. I hope you got some ideas from that that you can take away and use in your classroom. There are so many benefits of puzzles. Social, emotional, um, you know, turn-taking, everything. Puzzles and puppets, those are two of my very passionate topics. <laughs> Ooh, puzzles outside on the playground. I haven't thought of that one. How does that work for you, Noelle? Let us know in the comments below. I love that. Yeah, sometimes if we have a small space, floor puzzles aren't possible. Um, but I do love the benefits that they have if you can do them. But if you, if you can't have them in the classroom, that's fine too because um, you can use like these little puzzles here, little teeny amounts of space, just stack them up. <laughs> and I don't, ha you don't have to, depending on your program, right? Some programs are very scripted and prescribed, but um, having puzzles in centers like math and science, that's totally cool too. So these are shape puzzles. So I had them in my math center. I also had a set of science puzzles and they had like different animals and different nature things on them and those were in my science center. Um, I had a set of alphabet puzzles just like this. Lakeshore made this all kinds of sets of these. I don't know if they still have them. And I had a set of alphabet puzzles in my ABC center. I didn't have all 26 out at the same time because that was a bit much and storage was a problem. But I could select which ones I wanted out each week. Um, yeah, so. And then I had my nursery rhyme puzzles in my literacy center as well, because they're literacy, right? Anytime the kids are putting together a nursery rhyme puzzle, I'm going to ask them to retell the rhyme, right? Um, so yeah, that's totally literacy as well. So I hope you got some ideas you can use in your classroom for puzzles. And I put the link to the post um, where I have all this information. Um, in the description here so you can check that out if you want to if you know anyone who could benefit from these puzzle tips go ahead and share this broadcast with them in any way that you see fit